Hi, everybody, and welcome to Smarter News. I'm Jenna Lee, the founder of Smarter News. We're about quick, concise, nonpartisan information, except when we want to do a little further conversation on a big news story like the one that's sitting in front of us about China. And we really have the perfect guest, a return guest to Smarter News, someone who I consider also a friend. We've actually known each other for 15 years now, <laughs> if I have that math. It sounds like a lot when I say it out loud. And it is, we've been through a lot of different news cycles. And Gordon Chang, who's an author and analyst when it comes to China, one of the best leading voices on this particular issue, uh, has been so gracious to me throughout my entire journalism career. And I know for so many, Gordon. So it's great to have you back with us. Well, it's great to be on, Jenna. And you've been so gracious to Lydia and to me. So thank you. And Lydia is your wife. Uh, I, it is a fact, probably your better half. We can we can probably say that with some certainty. I'll have no to admit Gordon. it. <laughs> well, listen, we have a lot to get to today. We have news even coming in this morning about China. But we all bring our own paradigm to a headline when we see it. And your background, having lived and worked in China, having studied China for years now, I'm just curious, what was your gut reaction when you first heard the news about this so-called spy balloon? It was disbelief. I mean, I don't have a good view of the Chinese leaders, and I think they're bold and aggressive, but I couldn't believe that they would actually maneuver a spy balloon through the continental United States, hover it over um, sensitive sites, and think that there wouldn't be any reaction on our part. I mean, disbelief. Does it follow a pattern of behavior? It does, um, because the Chinese are especially aggressive and arrogant these days. Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, actually talks about how China is the world's only sovereign state, because he talks about Tianxia, um, which is all under heaven. And Chinese officials since 2017 have been publicly talking about the moon and Mars as sovereign Chinese territory. So you can see that these are the most ambitious aggressors in history. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this tactic with the balloon was just so bold, so brazen. Um, it took me by surprise. What do you think of how it played out with the balloon floating over the United States for several days, the United States eventually taking it down? And by the way, I'm just going to show this if I can add it to our um our stream here, we can actually see some images. These are the first images of the recovery of the balloon that's taking place right now off the coast of the East Coast in the United States. So just how everything played out, Gordon, your observations and your thoughts. Yeah, there's been a lot of criticism of, of President Biden, and I'm a critic of his China policy. Um, but this is, I think, one um, instance in which somebody else deserves a lot more blame. We got to remember that this balloon first entered territorial U.S. airspace over the Aleutians on January 28th. And obviously, um, NORAD was um, tracking this well before it got to um, the Aleutians. This balloon traveled over Alaska and then traveled down Western Canada. And it was only on the fourth day that President Biden was informed and briefed of the existence of this balloon. Now, if that is indeed true, and that's the reporting, then we have a failure of our Pentagon to notify the commander in chief of a critical threat to the United States. And the practical aspect of that is that um, once it crossed into Idaho, and this is when around the time President Biden was informed, um, the military then said, well, we shouldn't try to shoot it down because there might be a damage, there might be um, personal um, loss of life. And so then Biden said, OK, we won't shoot it down. But then China surveilled um, Maelstrom Air Force Base, where we have intercontinental ballistic missiles, Minot, where there are also ICBMs, F.E. Warren, um, a third missile base, Offit, which strategic command headquarters, and uh, Whiteman, where our B-2 bombers are based. And so China got a lot of information, um, and that was a result of a failure to notify the commander in chief in time. What do you think China's up to? I don't know. Um, there are two main possibilities, or maybe three if you want, um, as to what's going on. And we don't know which of the ones are the better ones. One of them is just that there are some elements in Beijing that did not want uh, uh, Secretary of State 
Antony Blinken to visit because he was scheduled to visit the Chinese capital fifth and sixth of this month. So that's a possibility. But there are two other things which I think are more probable. One of them is that Xi Jinping is just so arrogant, he wanted to humiliate the United States. He wanted to show that we were incapable, not able to defend our own airspace, because that fits in with the Chinese propaganda narrative that uh, the U.S. is finished as a world power and that countries should ditch us and instead obey China. So that's one possibility, that this was approved by Xi Jinping. The other possibility is that the Chinese military has now grown so politically powerful that it can do what it wants and that this um, balloon operation um, was basically either the generals and admirals said we're doing this um, and told Xi Jinping and Xi might not have been in a position to stop it or they just didn't tell anybody and they did it on their own. Um, the parallel here would be the Japanese military in the 1930s because they took over the Japanese political system and then they launched World War II. World War II, we often think 1939 Poland. No, World War II was probably 1937 when Japan attacked China for the second time that decade. So that's what we're talking about here. That falls in line with something you put out on social media today, and I wanted to ask you about it. It certainly got my attention. You said on Twitter, the world has never been closer to a nuclear exchange than now. Why do you think that, and how does that, how does what we're talking about fit into that? Yeah, there's only two other incidences which come close. The Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and the Checkpoint Charlie Crisis in Berlin of the year before. But and, and, and the Cuban Missile Crisis looked far more dangerous than today. But we know from the archives that it, in fact, was not. And the reason is we know from the Soviet archives that Khrushchev was never going to launch his um, ballistic missiles at the United States. And of course, we know Kennedy didn't want to either. So although those, although those two crises looked worse, um, they're not. Right now, we don't know what Xi Jinping um, is willing to do. We don't even know if he's in charge um, on something like this. So that's what creates this um, sense of danger. Um, and also because the United States, we know um, for various reasons, is not deterring China. The Chinese, we don't have to speculate, the Chinese have said that um, for the last two and a half years. So they've got a dangerous mentality. Um, and so therefore, I think that deterrence is broken down. We saw that with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Anything can happen now, Jenna. Well, we've talked through multiple administrations now, uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, many different styles of leadership from President Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden. So we're seeing not only different political parties in power, but different styles of leadership entirely. And one of the consistent themes that we've talked about, Gordon, over the years is that China isn't deterred by a myriad of different things that we've done. So what do you think is key to deterrent? Well, we have to change our policies because although what we're doing right now sounds responsible, you know, we have this notion of restraint and we think, oh, that's very responsible. From the Chinese, Russian, Iranian, North Korean points of view, that looks feeble. And so um, right now, because deterrence is broken down, every option going forward is extremely dangerous. There are no risk-free options anymore. But I believe that we obviously have to change course because this drift, which has now become momentum, is really frightening. So I think that we need to show the Chinese we're not afraid of them. And in order to do that, there are a number of different options. But one of them, of course, would be to um, close their consulates. They got four remaining consulates in the U.S., uh, strip the embassy staff down next to nothing, tell the Chinese we're not talking to you anymore. And the reason is, um, China is in no mood to talk to us. It's not going to um, act in good faith with regard to us. So why should we be trying to talk? By trying, you know, by sending um, Secretary Blinken to Beijing, even before this balloon crisis, even before that, um, it was clear that we were desperately trying to maintain communication and the Chinese would cut off communications anytime they wanted. So we need to show the Chinese, we need to show the Chinese what they show us. They often not talk to us for obtaining, um, you know, from a strategic point of view. Well, we should just return the favor and not talk to them. Well, I'm sure any anyone that's listening to this could understand that that strategy 
Um, as a parent, I can. I actually used it last night with my three-year-old. <laughs> when I'm not talking to you anymore, it is time to go to bed. <laughs> right. And there's a little bit of a standoff. I know this is far more complicated, but in some cases, it's not, right? Or sometimes it's just very basic about relations. But there are those that will say engagement is always better. We always have to engage. And that doing that sort of act would actually just ramp things up. To someone who says that, what is your response? We've been engaged in China for, since 1972. We've intensely, intensively engaged them since the Cold War. Um, and it's created this dangerous, disastrous situation. So although it sounds right, Jenna, um, it's produced horrible results. So we got to try something new. I can't say something new is going to be better, but I can say that the momentum of events is going to lead us to the worst moment in history. So at this moment, let's try something new because at least we have a chance of rescuing this. We're a far stronger society than China. Um, and part of the reason is that, um, well, the part of the problem, I think, is that the Chinese see critical problems at home. They see a closing window of opportunity. All sorts of things are going on. Um, but we need to show them that we believe we're stronger than them and that we will fight if they attack us. And if they do something like they just did with this spy balloon, we will impose disproportionately high costs on China so that they will never do that again. Yeah, that's dangerous, but um, at least it has a chance of working. Interesting. I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on inside of China, because that's something we don't get a lot of insight into. And it's something that you're able to provide us. Before we do, I just want to look over the actions of the United States. Just This is very broadly over the last, let's just say, a couple months, Gordon, because we've seen a few different things happen. Yes, we saw Secretary of State Tony Blinken with a trip planned to engage China diplomacy. We also saw now former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi go with a delegation to Taiwan to show support for Taiwan, which China could interpret as something that they don't like. Uh, just plainly speaking, they consider Taiwan part of their country. And, and we're, we're walking this diplomatic tightrope with Taiwan to support Taiwan's independence, but still saying that we believe in one China. <laughs> That's a whole other hour or two uh, interview. But we had Nancy Pelosi on the ground there with some other high-ranking lawmakers in a show of presence for Taiwan. Then we also had our Secretary of Defense just last week in the Philippines, where we're opening four new military bases, which is a really big deal in the Philippines, where we haven't right. been able to do that for years. So you see, you're kind of seeing a range of different messages towards China. Is any one of those correct? Uh, is the combination too disorienting? Does it need to be more in lockstep? Because those are very, again, very different messages. Just to put a finer point on that, the reason why we would want military bases in the Philippines is because of its proximity to China. So what do you think about all of that? Well, those are good steps, um, but they're not occurring fast enough. Um, right now, um, China's preparing for war. Um, we can see this at the Communist Party's 20th National Congress in October. Xi Jinping appointed what's now called the War Cabinet. Um, he is engaged in the fastest military buildup since the Second World War. He's trying to sanction proof his regime. And he's also mobilizing China's civilians for war. And perhaps that's the most ominous. But, you know, we always, we can't judge intentions. We can't see what's inside of his head. But we can see what he's doing. And he's prepared to go to war, and we are sort of sleeping. Um, this is why is he preparing? Why, like, why? Why would he want to go to war? Um, I think there's the closing window of opportunity. Um, also, he's made it a test of his personal legitimacy to annex Taiwan. Um, you know, in the past, you have Chinese leaders, communist Chinese leaders, say, you know, we believe that Taiwan should be part of the People's Republic. But they were just really going through the motions. Xi Jinping is not. He's been saying that Taiwan must be annexed during his rule, which he calls the new era, quote unquote. So um, this, is, this is a man with a very dangerous set of uh, calculations. I think that he believes that he is personally in a weak position and that um, he, he knows that if he loses, um, if he fails, that he could very well lose everything. Got to remember, he 
inherited a consensual political system in 2012, where no Chinese leader got too much credit or too much blame. So there was no real personal accountability. But Xi Jinping grabbed power from everybody else, which mean, meant he also took accountability because there's nobody else to blame. And the other thing is that he inherited a political system where a loser got a very nice life. But what Xi Jinping has done is he's up the cost of losing by, among other things, jailing his opponents. So Xi Jinping, put those two things together. He's got all these domestic crises. Everyone knows he's responsible for them. He has nobody else to blame. He knows that he could lose everything should he lose a political struggle. So when you have such a low threshold of risk, you can do anything because you think, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to die anyway. So why don't I roll the dice and see if I can live? And by the way, this is a Vladimir Putin problem that we face. So we That's got these two large states with leaders who are very fragile. And it comes down to power and wanting to maintain that power. As you were talking about President Xi, I was thinking about how uh, President Putin has been described to us as well in the past. So what is happening inside of China? You said so, uh, some of the turmoil inside the, the country he's to blame for. We've seen some of the protests because of COVID. We've seen some of the shutdowns as well. Uh, tell us, based on your reading and your research, what is the state of life in China right now? Uh, China is trying to get through COVID. Um, it's been the largest viral outbreak in history this winter. Um, there will be something like a billion, maybe a billion one infections. There'll be somewhere between one and two million deaths. Um, and, and this is people, the Chinese people are starting to say, well, um, they're blaming the Communist Party for this. Remember, they had three years of Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy, which was to prevent any transmission of the disease, which was perhaps the most strict zero uh, uh, COVID control measures anywhere on earth. And then on December 7th, they just abandoned zero COVID. And now people are saying, well, what was that three years for? And um, there's a lot of unhappiness, um, especially because the economy is very weak. It contracted last year in reality even though they said they grew 3.0%, it didn't. Um, China right now has got a basically zero growth economy. Property prices are still continuing to fall. And that's very important because the Chinese people put their wealth into property. 70% of the wealth of the middle class is property and property prices are continuing to fall. So you have pretty unhappy people there. Um, and that doesn't bode well for um, stability and it doesn't bode well for China acting responsibly in the international scene. So if I'm a young person in China with, you know, let's say a young family, why would I want to get behind President Xi if there's this buildup towards war and defending the country if I'm not satisfied with the current state of affairs? Yeah, and a lot of people are trying to leave. Um, you know, those migrants that are coming in our southern border, increasingly we're seeing uh, Chinese, um, people who have left the mainland. Um, most people can't leave. Um, so what they have is just sort of pessimism. You know, the Chinese, young Chinese in their 20s, they say, uh, we're the last generation. Um, and that shows you just a very dark outlook that most people have. Things may get better in the spring if the disease goes away and the economy recovers a little bit. And I think the economy will recover because last year was so bad. But the point is, it, this is a very unhappy society in China. Remind me of the last time you were in China. I know it's a long time ago, um, Gordon. You were, you were working, totally different career. Um, but w when was the last time you were there? We were, last time in the mainland China was November 2013. I gave a speech in Shanghai to um, a global convention of lawyers. Last time I was in the People's Republic, which includes Hong Kong and Macau, because after that November 13, I just, uh, uh, 2013, I just thought it was too dangerous for me personally to go back. I, I was so, curious about that. Yeah. Yes. So we went to Hong Kong and Macau because there you can learn a lot about the mainland. Um, but Hong Kong right now is um, dicey to say the least. Some people say it's even more dangerous to be in Hong Kong than it is to be in the mainland because the rules are changing so fast. You don't know where the lines are anymore. So the last time we were in Hong Kong, uh, or Macau was August uh, 2019. 
Oh, that not that long ago, right before the pandemic, though, before all the travel was was shut Bef down. Before the pandemic, but during the the protests. Um, That's right. How interesting! What interesting time to be there. It, for th for those that could be new to you, Gordon, can you just tell us a little bit about your background, and then I'm going to get into some of our our viewer questions as well. We have a couple good ones coming in, and we have some people watching us live. Uh, and I encourage them if they have any questions for you to go ahead and put them on the board because I'll use them. And this is a great opportunity to be connected to such a great a source. But can you tell us a little bit about your background? It's such a great story about how you ended up uh, becoming this voice on China. Um, yeah, I, I practice law. Um, and and um, most of my practice was in Asia, was in Hong Kong for 10 years, um, then five years in San Diego. But I was we were traveling across the Pacific all the time. So we finally decided to move to Shanghai, which we did in August uh, 1996, stayed there to May 2001. I stopped practicing law as uh, the, the 20th century became the 21st um, and wrote a book called The Coming Collapse of China, which... I predicted, um, this is time for humility, um, I predicted the failure of the Communist Party within 10 years, so by the middle of 2011. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've, I've I'm so fascinated by China, I've continued to write and speak about it. Well, and and just to give you a little shout out, though, you said 2011 coming collapse, but you just told us in 2012 there was a changeover with the Communist Party and things started to get a little bit different. So kind of interesting timing on that, Gordon. I'm going to give you a little there's a little something there. You don't have to. <laughs> well, thank like, you. It was, it was a bold headline, you know, you yeah. never know if it's <laughs> you had a 50-50 shot. <laughs> so um, some great questions coming in, and Angela had a really good one. She was asking about what does escalation look like? There's a lot of talk about this situation, broadly speaking, between the United States and China escalating, she wants to know, well, what would that actually look like to an average American? Um, it will be, there'll be a lot of friction. Um, there will be, I think, a reduction in our relations with China. Um, and we'll see businesses pulling out of China, as they already have been for quite some time. Um, and uh, we are going to look at China in a very different way. Um, you know, I hope that, for instance, uh, Chinese parties will no longer be able to buy farm and ranch land in the U.S. Um, you know, TikTok may be banned or may be forced sale to an American company. Um, all sorts of uh, pulling apart will occur. Um, escalation beyond that is war, um, which is entirely possible. Uh, I don't think a war with China would remain conventional for long. Um, so it is uh, first world's first nuclear exchange could occur. Um, we just don't know. We, we were very, if you remember during the Cold War, everybody was really concerned about the Soviet Union. And we were so fortunate that like only six or seven people died when the Soviet Union fell in those protests in Moscow. Um, that's not to say that we're going to be that lucky when we see another large communist state start to crumble, um, because I think China has um, far more um, aggressive and bold and confident leaders than Gorbachev. There's no Gorbachev in China, as far as we can tell. Interesting, interesting comparison there. This is a, a great question for Megan, who's live with us now. She says that she lives in Montana which I'm sure she had a very unique experience with this whole news cycle herself. She, she says, I live in Montana. We have many missile sites. Do you think the Chinese balloon was targeting things such as this? Yes, because that balloon hovered over Maelstrom Air Force Base, where we have ICBMs. It then went to F.E. Warren in Wyoming, which is another ICBM field. Minot, a third IC, ICBM field, it went to Offutt which is Omaha, Nebraska, which is the head of strategic command. And then it went to Whiteman in Missouri, which is the home of the B-2s. So that's two legs of the triad, our, our strategic deterrence. Um, and so the, the Chinese were, were not trying to hide what they were concerned about and interested in trying to find information about. So, yeah, um, you know, Montana is, uh, Montana will be a target. Hmm. Scary to think about that. That for that's for sure. And I think it's important. You know, the China says that this was accidental. 
that this was not what we're saying it is, uh, just so that we're clear about where they're still, they're still maintaining that. But to your point and to others uh, who are saying, this is very intentional and very bold because they knew they had to be of a lower elevation to get the sort of surveillance that they need. And if they, if they had other options, you know, satellites and everything else, right. <laughs> and we don't even look, we don't, we're not able to see on a regular basis, but this was particularly bold because of that reason, which well, is scary to think about. It's our territorial airspace. And, and mm -hmm. yes, they could get intelligence that they couldn't get from a satellite or other means. But Jenna, the other thing is that they could see our reactions. They now know what we can and would do and what we wouldn't do. So, for instance, yesterday, um, the head of NORAD and the U.S. Northern Command, uh, General uh, Glenn Van Herc, actually said, my rules of engagement, I, I couldn't shoot that thing down. So, uh, well, you know, the Chinese kind of got... Please go ahead. I'm trying to pull up the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal because they had an interesting take on this as well, which was super scary, but I think it's important that we're wide-eyed about what's in, ahead of us. Uh, the editorial board had written about the potential that on a balloon like this, there could actually be a weapon. And that while the assumption could be that it's a surveillance balloon, it could actually have a weapon on it that detonates above, above the ground right. that can wreak havoc. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I'm sure you've heard about that. I don't want to go too far in that direction, Gordon, but uh, it is the possibility, you know, this is a major international newspaper that is mentioning this. So can you talk to us a little bit about that scenario? Yeah, this is an enormous balloon and it can carry a big payload and that payload can be switched in and out. So um, we assume that the payload this time was a surveillance pod, um, but they could easily put in a, an electric magnetic pulse weapon, which would take out our grid. Or people have said that they could put in drones that were would be released. God knows what they were thinking about, because China has a big balloon fleet. So um, this could be very different. And and remember, we spent we shot this thing down with a four hundred thousand dollars Sidewinder missile. Um, China can build these balloons a lot cheaper than that, and so it gives them a big advantage. Interesting. So I have two questions for Melissa. I showed both of them on the screen and she's hitting on both th both themes that have been hit on in conversation as well as the news cycle. And we're going to, we're going to finish up here, Gordon, because I know you're running to additional interviews. One of the questions she had was this idea that government officials in the United States are somehow compromised by China. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on that? That sometimes is kind of thrown out there um, by critics of the current administration, but I'm curious your thoughts having Look, worked and talked to the U.S. government over the years. Her second question is about who are the great allies about China. So you can take those however, however, whatever, whatever order you see fit. Yeah, the first question is going to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a couple things here. Um, China has compromised American officials. They've done it through money. They've done it through blackmail. Um, you know, all of these hacks. China gets enormous amounts of information about people. Um, and sensitive information. So they, people are being compromised that way as well. But, you know, it's, it's mostly, I, I'm more worried about the general uh, engagement theory that they don't need to compromise individuals. They, you know, we have a series of, we have a lot of officials who have views which I think are very dangerous to the United States. There, there's, you know, President Biden yesterday talked about how this balloon incident would not change U.S. policy towards China. I mean, how could it not? Um, on the second question, does China have allies? Uh, China has only one formal military ally. That's North Korea. And a lot of people poo-poo that relationship. But if China were to invade Taiwan, we can be pretty sure that North Korea would invade South Korea or would cause some disturbance to distract the United States. There's always been this relationship between North Korea and Taiwan. When there's problems in one area, there's going to be problems in the other. Um, and then, of course, there's Vladimir Putin. Um, China and Russia are very close together. China's been supporting the Russian war effort in Ukraine. Um, so we could expect uh, Russia to use its reserves. If, if China were to invade Taiwan, we could expect Russia to use its reserves and move against Ukraine in, in greater numbers. 
or whatever. You know, this is just frightening. This is this is how World War Three would start. You got war on one end of the Eurasian landmass in Ukraine. You got war at the other end of the Eurasian landmass. You could have Pakistan go after India in the middle of Eurasia. You could have Algeria go after Morocco, North Africa. This is how this war can spread because once there's a failure of deterrence, bad things happen. You know, as we have seen in our lives, when good trends reinforce themselves, so do the bad ones. And at this moment, it is the destructive forces that are driving events. What is the one thing you think we could do today that would change it? I would think that President Biden would um, get behind his desk in the Oval Office in front of a TV camera and say, um, the United States will defend Taiwan. Um, we'll offer a mutual defense treaty. We'll base a tripwire American forces in, in Taiwan. We're going to preposition equipment and supplies there. The Chinese would hate it, but the Chinese aren't going to take us on. Um, so it's, again, a lot of people will say it's provocative, but at this point, um, our policy of strategic ambiguity has been provocative in the sense as Donald Rumsfeld, when he was Secretary of Defense, said, weakness is provocative. And so we've got to start projecting strength. We have got to have the President of the United States saying, if China's mobilizing for war, we will mobilize for war. And I think that might have some effect on the psychology of, if not Xi Jinping, then others who will think this is not going in China's direction because the United States is a far stronger society than China, but we could lose because we are not preparing for what the Chinese are preparing for. Mm. It gives us a lot to think about. If if we all started, you know, just stopped buying everything from China tomorrow, Gordon, even in our own little worlds, you know, even for me in the, in the middle of Texas, if I just no more buying anything from China, could could the American people and those small moves make major policy differences? Absolutely. And we could also ditch mutual funds that have Chinese stocks. So a lot of the mm. international mutual funds have Chinese stocks. If you go to your broker and say, I just want to sell it, um, that's going to have a big effect. Um, Senator Rick Scott of Florida has been pushing cool legislation. That's cool as in C-O-O-L, country of origin labeling, which forces websites to tell us where this stuff is from. And that means as consumers, we can make everyday purchasing decisions to support American businesses. Um, and also just one other thing. Um, there's something called the Thrift Savings Plan, which is basically the federal government's 401k. And since 2001, members of the uniform services can invest in TSP. TSP actually has in its mutual fund window a lot of Chinese stocks, including stocks of Chinese companies that Americans cannot deal with because those companies are on the Commerce Department's entity list. This is You can own these companies, but you can't deal with them. This is insane. So that that I've never heard that before. <laughs> I mean, so, that that sounds crazy. So talk to your talk to your congressman. And because this was up last in the last Congress on the National Defense Authorization Act, someone wanted to put this into a rider to prevent TSP from owning Chinese stocks. It unfortunately didn't make it. But this is a new Congress and we should be pushing this stuff because our men and women in uniform should not be paying for the weapons that are being designed to kill them. I, I've never heard it. That's, that's something I have to follow up on, Gordon. And, and TSP. I'm, okay, absolutely. And as well as, as you mentioned, uh, Rick Scott's uh, legislation as well. So a lot to look forward to and look into. As always, Gordon, we always learn so much. I know you have a busy day. I appreciate it very much. We're going into the State of the Union this evening with President Biden. So we're, we're filming this interview before that. It'll be interesting to watch what he has to say on, on an international stage that he'll have. And we look forward. It was, this has been sort of a, a yearly event, our interviews, Gordon, but I hope it's, it's more than that. <laughs> I'll try to catch you in the middle of a less busy news cycle, but I always appreciate you coming on to speak to us uh, when we really need the perspective. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jenna, because I'd love to do that. So anytime. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, Gordon, thank you so much. Say hi to Lydia. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, Gordon Chang, amazing. So 
just as a word to the wise, if you'd like to follow Gordon on social media, he's most active on Twitter, has about a quarter of a million followers there uh, under Gordon C. Chang, I believe. So check him out there. He also has a number of books. He mentioned The Coming Collapse of China, but he is a voracious writer and you can access a lot of his information through his website as well if you'd like to check him out more. If you're joining us live, thank you so much for your support of Smarter News. This is one way that you're able to support a free press, a nonpartisan press, and I hope to give you access, again, to really strong primary sources. We want the news to work for you again. That includes our reporting, but also putting you in touch with people to get your questions answered, because that's what good journalism is, not only reporting the information, but being a conduit for more information as well. And so we're trying to do something different. Your support really means a lot to us. However you are engaging with us live during this interview means a lot to us, as well as afterwards, you can always check us out at smarternews.com. But consider joining Scoop. Scoop is our insider group. Once a week, you get a cheat sheet for the week ahead and a special report that's about 20 minutes long that gives you sort of a broader view of what's going on with the news. This is my hope for you that you get a break from social media, get to pull back from the headlines somewhat. And you have this one report that kind of keeps you going and keeps you moving and frees you up because we want to free up your time. So you have less of the 24 hour news cycle, more time to live your own story. So check us out, scoop at smarternews.com. In the meantime, I'm going to go back, listen to this interview again. I do have those leads to follow up with, and I'll be curious your thoughts and comments on this interview as well. I'm interested in what you're interested in. So I look forward to your feedback and we'll see you with more at smarternews.com. Have a great day guys. And I'll see you soon. Bye.